I'm Lynn Hill. Welcome to the Fundamentals of Climbing, where I'm going to break down the essential elements of climbing technique. The reason I decided to do this video series is that, as a climbing guide, I often found it difficult to try to explain technique while the person was climbing. They couldn't intellectually process what I was saying while they were engaged in the process of climbing itself. I could make a few simple suggestions, but it was useless to try to explain anything more complicated. My hope is that you'll gain a better understanding of the fundamental aspects of climbing movement when watching this video in a relaxed, thinking state of mind. Looking back on my formative years, I'm grateful for my roots as a traditional climber. I was also fortunate to have had the opportunity to hang out with a group of climbers known as the Stone Masters who were instrumental in pushing the level of free climbing in America. I developed a solid foundation of skills, starting with bouldering, big wall climbing, and ultimately sport climbing. Over the years, I've climbed so many different routes on various types of rock around the world, which has enabled me to become a much smoother and more efficient climber. Through shape and pattern recognition, I've gained the ability to identify the upcoming holds and body positions to assume in each situation. I've also developed a keen sense of body awareness, which is an essential asset when it comes to on-site climbing, taking calculated risks, or dealing with unexpected challenges. Starting as a young gymnast, I learned how to visualize the mechanics of movement. I imagined what it would look like if the movement was broken down into a few simple steps. Through trial and error, and asking myself the right questions, I gained a greater sense of kinesthetic body awareness. I've discovered that to optimize my own technique, it helps to ask the right questions. By paying attention to my own process, teaching and observing others, I've gained a more conscious understanding of the geometry and physics involved. My intention in creating this video is to show and explain what defines good technique. But in order for this information to be of use to you, it's crucial that you practice developing a three-dimensional awareness of your body position on the rock. Having a conscious understanding of the mechanics of movement can greatly enhance the learning process. Just like a language, we need to learn the grammar and vocabulary before being able to speak fluently. So I've decided to start out with this foundation of information that includes basic concepts, definitions, and examples of the various climbing techniques that I've used throughout my life. I've created some graphic tools that I've overlaid on top of the video images to help illustrate the forces and geometry of climbing movement. My hope is that watching these videos will give you the understanding and tools to deconstruct your own technique, especially when stumped on a move or a sequence on a climb. There are many ways to do a particular move or climb since each person has a different set of parameters with regard to personal style, body size, as well as their particular strengths and weaknesses. Even climbers of the same relative height can find slightly different ways to climb the same section of rock. No matter what our particular body size or how much natural talent we inherit, we all live in accordance with the same basic laws of physics. Countless times I've heard people say, she can do it because she's so strong, or she has such small fingers, or they simply say, she's a natural. With the right attitude and approach, we all have the potential to optimize our abilities and expand our vision of what's possible. I've been climbing since 1975, and I'm happy to say that I don't have any serious injuries or limitations. Part of the reason I've been able to avoid overuse injuries is that I have a reasonable approach and efficient movement patterns. I try respecting the natural alignment of my limbs and joints at all times. If a position hurts or feels awkward, I simply stop. It's not worth risking injury for the sake of a climb or boulder problem. I intend to keep climbing for as long as possible, which is why I believe in using good technique and good judgment. With consistent practice, we learn to anticipate the upcoming moves and how to position our body on the rock. Each hand or foot placement is coordinated to maintain balance and the necessary oppositional forces for upward progress. Since our actions are guided by the mind, it's clear that our mental state has the greatest impact on our ability to perform. Optimal performance follows when the mind is calm, undistracted, and in a constant state of adaptive focus. One of the biggest distractions that can inhibit our ability to climb naturally is our perception of danger or sense of fear. 
There are other mental distractions such as secondary pressures related to the ego, negative self-talk, or other people's expectations. Accepting our thoughts and feelings and learning to direct our attention to the right things at the right time is one of the most important skills of all. Once we achieve the right state of mind, we're able to focus on the more subtle aspects of technique. There's no substitute for the experience of climbing itself. After so many years, climbing has become a form of moving meditation. Beyond the pure enjoyment of moving over stone, climbing is a means of personal discovery, developing deep connections with other people and with the natural world. When I first started climbing, I didn't even know there was such thing as technique. Without any formal instruction, I learned through a process of trial and error and a gradual progression that allowed me to master the necessary skills before advancing to the next level. Good technique depends on the conservation of energy, respecting the most fundamental laws of geometry and physics. Efficiency in climbing is a function of how well we direct our center of gravity. While standing, our center of gravity is generally located about two inches below the belly button and two inches in toward the center of the body. However, when climbing, our center of gravity is not always located in the center of our body. To illustrate this point, I placed the light on the backs of two different climbers while climbing the same route. The distinctive path of light created by the more advanced climber indicates less wasted movement and a smoother progression of their center of the wall. To help illustrate the forces involved in the climbing process, I've created four different types of graphics. Points refer to our center of gravity with respect to our points of contact on the rock, which forms a kind of geometry. Vectors refer to the ideal linear direction of force, either on a hold or the line vector between holds. Planes refer to the varying planes of the wall with respect to our torso and center of gravity. Arcs refer to the path of movement that our limbs follow when either dissipating or generating momentum. <laughs> 